So I'm happy to announce that we finally have Mike Michalowicz on the show today. We tried to connect a few months ago, and we finally did it. Right, Mike? We did. We, we were back and forth on Twitter a I lot. Know. We were you, connecting you on Twitter. My favorite picture, by the way, with a book of all time. You had like, you had the tongue out. You're like, ah, I think you were screaming. Yeah, 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 like that. Yeah. Okay, that one. With okay. the hashtag profit first, right? Yep. Yeah. So we did that, and. <laughs> I've never seen it before. I like that. I you like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. So um, I just saw on Twitter yesterday that you came back from Hershey Park. Yes. I, oh, yeah. Look at this. I even got my little keys fob still. Oh, I, come on. Yeah. They, go, they put your name on it. I don't know if you can see that. Um, Tilt it down a little bit. There we go. I can, yeah. So I they put your name right here on these I keys. I see that. It's a shame because it's such a waste of uh, plastic. Like you can't reuse the keys now. Um, What's the key for? Well, it's for the hotel room, but then also to get on the shuttle bus, you have to display your key, and that's why they, they have the name on it. Uh, oh, I see. It's yeah. not like the key to the city or anything. No, no, it's not even close, no. Oh, gotcha. It would be a pretty awesome key because it's all chocolate. So if you're, in, <laughs> you know, if you're in the Not the right kind of chocolate, I'm sorry. Love me no. some chocolate, not that plastic. Yeah, no, no, no it's not the right kind of chocolate. Yeah. And, and Hershey's chocolate is kind of, it's, it's good, but... There's certain chocolate that just blows it away. I've had like dark chocolate with like salt on it and stuff. That is just amazing. Mm -hmm. Hershey doesn't make that. Stuff. Nice to enhance. I know. Yeah. I, I've been yeah. to on the tour as well. It's it's a cool place. Cool place. It's definitely cool. It's nice to have you home, Mike. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's good to be back. Here in New Jersey, been touring the country. I know. So yeah. I, I want to uh, give you all a little introduction. If you don't know who Mike McCallowitz is, you sure will know very it's like soon. Far. If you don't know who I am, like who are you? Yeah. I know. <laughs> Best-selling author. It's crazy. So by his 34th, 35th birthday, um, Mike had founded and sold two multi-million dollar companies. Okay, so he was confident that he had the formula to success, and he became an angel investor, and then he lost his entire fortune. Then he started it all over again, driven to find better ways to grow healthy, strong companies. So Mike created the Profit First formula, which we're going to go into today a way for businesses to ensure profitability from the very next deposit forward. So he's now running his third million dollar venture, a former business consultant for Wall Street Journal, a former MSNBC business makeover expert. No wonder it took months to get you on. <laughs> uh, and the author of one of my favorites, The Pumpkin Plan. And I can't show you this way, Pumpkin Plan, because it's on audiobooks and it's on my iPad. Uh -huh which actually have my notes for today's interview. So uh, I was having so much fun um, in, in the car traveling, listening to the pumpkin plan uh, uh -huh. on my way to the destinations. And every so often there would be just some real character, okay, for lack of a better word, yeah, yeah, yeah. just making me laugh as, as I would be listening to this book and just kind of talking like this, <laughs> you know? And it was so funny. So I just want to say that your reads are really, really easy, and they're oh. so much fun. Oh, that's so, awesome. Thank yeah, you. so welcome to the show, Mike. So, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank I'm you so much. Fired up to be here. I am more fired up. I am so excited. To have I you. No, I'm more fired up. You better watch. I'm more are fired you? up. Oh, yeah, Do you know I'm from Brooklyn? Is that what I know you're from about? Brooklyn. Getting so, it. Yeah. That no, I, I know. That does scare me a little bit. Yeah, it does scare bit. me a little bit. All right, little well... Bit. This is Skype, so you're safe. Yeah. Okay. I think. So I want to ask you a question because I, I was reading the book. Okay, I, yeah. I did, and, and I got your your PDF download, and we're going to talk um, a little bit later on in the show about that, how people can get their download of of a piece of this book, uh, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. And when I was reading through it, I was really caught by the first chapter, um, actually the introduction when you went into how you were on Creative Live, and I'm a huge, huge fan of Creative oh, Live. Oh, cool. Okay, so yes, I did read your book. I, I know you're probably surprised at that, um, but it's fantastic. And I know that you know, education is, is totally something important to you. I know that you do a lot of lectures and you're on the circuit all around the country. So you had an interesting story when you opened up this book about a piggy bank. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have the hardcover here. So you have the pre-release copy. This is the uh, the hardcover that's now out. So yeah, that yours like kind of wobbles. This one's like a rock. <laughs> same thing. It's the exact same thing. But um, so yeah, so my piggy bank moment, I call it, mm -hmm. was after I sold my second company, uh, I became a millionaire and I was 35 years old. 
And what happened, I sold to a Fortune 500 and there was all this fanfare of selling a company and something changed in me, which I never thought would, because I promised myself I'd never be one of those guys, mm -hmm. but I just became full of myself. I was arrogant. I was like, oh, I am a genius. I know how to build companies and sell them. I can do this over and over again. I'm Mr. Money. Look how great I am. And started buying trophies to show how successful I was. The cars, the bigger house, I moved into an expensive town, right. joined the club, mm -hmm. you know, like the private club, all this nonsense. Um, and also became an angel investor at the same time. Um, an angel investor is someone who's, who invests in brand new startup companies. Right. Well, ends up I'm the angel of death because I sucked at investing um, and I was full of myself and it took me a mere two years and I lost, I mean, I lost everything, Vicky. And uh, I came home to my family. I have three children. Mm -hmm. I sat down with my wife and my kids uh, on this day and, and t told them I lost them, lost everything. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's something I was keeping secret from, from them. I was, I was lying by omission. I was like, ah, oh, I'll, I'll fix this. And I just kept on throwing money, good money after bad, effectively. Okay. Lost everything, told them I'm, I was sobbing. Uh, I was so embarrassed and ashamed of what I've done. And my, my daughter, while I was telling them this, ran out of the room. She was nine years old. Mm -hmm. And I remember Vicky when she ran out, I wanted to run out of the room too. Like that's what I wanted to do, run away. Right. She came back mm -hmm. 30 seconds later with her piggy bank and she put it down and she slid it to me and she says, uh, Daddy, I'm going to help us. I'm going to support us. And, um, and that's a tough moment. That's a tough moment. So it's, it was the most humbling moment of my life. Mm -hmm. And it was, the, it was kind of a slap to the face that I needed that I was so financially poor, poorly prepared. I, was, I had no understanding of financials, even though my ego was saying, I know everything about money, how to make it, how to keep getting it. I really knew nothing about it. And I realized then that profit is not an event. It's not something that happens one day. It's not some future moment when you sell a company or that big client comes in. Mm -hmm. Profit is not an event. It's a habit. It's something that has to be instilled in us that we have to live by every single day. Profit's a series of many small, small wins mm -hmm. but happen every day as opposed to these big moments. And uh, I then endeavored to, to figure it out. And that's actually how this book came about. Like this, this came about four years later, five years later okay. after having that. I started to f kind of figure out the formula, and, and I think I found it. I think you did, too. It's a great read. I've been looking at the reviews on Amazon.com, and they are just insane. I have to read one of them. This is Mike Michalowicz has got it right. Cla cash is the lifeblood of every business. And as I just read the, as I read just the introduction in Chapter 1, right, like I was talking about, of Profit First, I knew Michalowicz was on, is it Michalowicz or Michalowicz? No, you're nailing it, Michalowicz. Okay. Like you're the, it's that Brooklyn accent or something that's I nailed. was reading the phonetics. Look, I'm trying to control the Brooklyn accent a little bit. I, <laughs> I'm hoping I'm doing a good job. But, you're nailing it, okay. like, yeah. Okay, so I knew Michalowicz was onto something very profound. If you were watching me read the intro, you would have seen several open-handed slaps to my forehead. That, <laughs> that's pretty powerful. Okay. That's cool. So, yeah. So talk to me a little bit about why entrepreneurs do struggle um, yeah. ever making a profit. Tell yeah. me a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. So there, he, here's what blew my mind. I started doing research. Mm -hmm. I found that there's 28 million small businesses in the U.S. These are companies doing uh, $5 million or less in revenue. That's, that's what I'm doing. Chances are that's what you're doing. That's what the majority of small businesses do, $5 mm -hmm. million in revenue or less. And of those... Most of them are less than a million dollars in revenue. And here's what blew my mind. Out of those 28 million businesses, 21 million are break even, meaning they're living check by check. <clears throat> they, they don't know how they're going to pay their bills next month okay. unless they get a lot of sales that come in. Right, right. And, and here's what makes no sense. That means there's 28 million people in the U.S. that are smart enough, courageous enough, have the gumption to start a business, attract customers, sell what they're doing, manage the cash flow to some degree. Like entrepreneurs are that smart, mm -hmm. yet they're not smart enough to make a profit. Like that didn't compute. How could people do 99% of the stuff right but not make a profit? So I started researching out what's the common things that entrepreneurs are doing around money. Right. And I found there's only one thing. There's a formula we use uh, in the technical term. It's called GAP. 
or GAAP right. stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. The formula is this, sales minus expenses mm -hmm. equals profit, right? So you, you, you sell what you can, you subtract the costs you incur to run your business, to rent your space, to hire contractors or employees, uh, and, then, and then whatever's left over is profit. Mm -hmm. But here's the absurdity of it. The leftover is profit. Profit is the final afterthought. It's the surprise at the end of the month or most often at the end of the year when the accountant comes back and says, oh, you made $500 this year. Surprise. Like, surprise. I made $500. It's funny. And, and, and often when they say, oh, you made a small profit, mm -hmm. we don't see the cash. It's gone because profit on an accounting basis and cash is totally different. Um, but more often than not, it's we lost money and, and it's like oh we lost money at least we don't pay as much in taxes but I have nothing to show for it I'm struggling mm -hmm. so when I figured this out that that there's a common formula I started studying the formula and the formula the formula we've been followed following is totally flawed the formula of sales minus expenses equals profit is what's causing businesses to not be profitable because there's things called axioms and an axiom is is that there's a commonly held belief that the world believes to be true and therefore anyone that hears about this says well the world believes it therefore it's true mm -hmm. an axiom used to be like the world is flat right. and here the world is flat. everyone believe that because you, know, you go to the edge of the planet you're gonna fall off are you getting the book the world is flat yeah so there you go the world is flat well we believed it was physically flat mm -hmm. that you couldn't navigate the globe otherwise you'd fall off the edge so many people believed it that they became the common truth and ships wouldn't go far out into the ocean it was too risky then someone challenged it and says the world's round and people are like you're crazy the world is not round mm -hmm. they jail people like that enough people started saying the world is round then Christopher Columbus proves it and the thing is we have the same problem going on with accounting the reason that formula sales minus expenses equals profit doesn't work is because there's a human behavioral trait called Parkinson's theory. This has nothing to do with Parkinson's okay. disease. Okay. Parkinson's theory works like this. Whatever is av made available to you, you consume in its entirety. It's, the, it's human nature to consume the entirety of a resource that's made available to us. Right. Here, here's an example. Say you and I are doing a project together, and you, I say to you, hey, Vicki, it's going to take me a week to get this project done. Can I turn it in next week? Mm -hmm. And you say, okay. It will take me a week to do that project. Right. If, if the exact same project, same commitment between me and you, but I say it's going to take six weeks, it will now take me six weeks to get it done. Right. I consume the entirety of the time made available to me. Same thing with, with food. If we serve a, a plate of food, we fill up the plate, mm -hmm. the entire plate. If the plate's bigger and we serve it up, we'll eat the entire plate. If the plate is way small, we'll eat the entire right. plate. The entirety of the resource that we put there, we consume. Well, the final analogy is with money. That formula, sales minus expenses equals profit. We sell, we put money into our bank account, we look at our bank account, there's money there, we use it to cover all the expenses. Whatever money is available, Parkinson's law, it goes toward expenses. And that's why there's never money left over. That's why 21 million businesses are not profitable. Gotcha. That's like the healthy habits that you talk about, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So runs... you get small plates, your vegetables first, um, remove temptation, and the rhythm. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, that last one almost sounds like it's pornographic. A yeah, little bit. a little bit. <laughs> it sounds like Kama Sutra, but um, <laughs> so those four things are that you just touched on are all elements. And actually, you're you're a fitness expert, so uh, those four elements are from the health industry. Mm -hmm. What they found is that most people can't do the programs that we see on TV, like P90X, or yeah, um, really. you know, those the thigh master, like all these products that come out, we see in infomercials, you see a before and after picture. Right, right. They never show the after after picture. Like what did the person look like after they did this program? Mm -hmm. The reason most of those programs failed, they work in the moment, but they require us to change who we are. P90X requires if you don't never work out, you better start working out super intensely two hours a day, every single day for the rest of your life. Right. And yes, you will be ripped. But it's for us to change our own natural behavior is nearly impossible. If you're a smoker, you know smoking's bad for you. To stop smoking is not that easy. It's really, really hard. Right, right. So in the fitness industry, they found don't try to change people's habits. Mm -hmm. You can't. Right. Instead, change the rules around their habits. First principle is small plates. The plates our house, say, are this big. If we simply reduce the plate size, if you cut your plate size in half, you mm -hmm. buy smaller plates, right. 
you can continue your habit of fill up the plate with your food like we always do right. and eat everything on our plate like mom says. Right, right. And by simply changing the plate size, less caloric intake, less weight. Mm -hmm. The second principle from the health industry is the sequencing of food. We, we all know we need to eat our vegetables, but most of us don't. We, you know, the, the steak comes, the vegetables are pushed to the side, and we start eating the steak. Mm -hmm. They said, instead, just change the sequence. Serve the vegetables and nothing else first. Then eat what you want of your vegetables. Once the vegetables are done, then serve the next meal. And what's interesting here is that if we eat our vegetables first, we'll eat more of them. Secondly, they take up some space in our stomach, so we're less hungry when the meat's served. And then you eat that, and you'll eat less of the meat, and you'll balance out your meal. So just change the sequence, and you have to continue your natural habit of, of eating. And, and you're <coughs> relating that to businesses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's – I can start tying them in. Gotcha. When it comes to the small plates mm -hmm. um, in the health industry, most businesses have one large plate for their business. It's called their checking account. Mm -hmm. uh, most companies uh, that I meet with, most entrepreneurs, have a bank account. Maybe they have a second one. But that bank account um, is where all the money comes in all the deposits, and then when they're paying bills, all the money comes out of there. Right, right. That is one massive plate. It's very hard to see clearly where the money really should be allocated. We see $1,000 come in in our plate, and we say, oh, there's $1,000 for bills. There's mm -hmm. $1,000. But that's not true. That money has other purposes. But since we have one massive plate, we can't tell. Um, just to really play out this analogy, because I want to drive it home, um, like think about Thanksgiving. We serve that one big plate with the turkey on it, it would be absurd to tell the family around the table and friends to say, oh, just eat, eat off the plate. Just eat off the serving tray because you wouldn't know what's a portion for who. It would just be mayhem. So what we do is we cut slices and you hand it to each person so everyone has their fair share of turkey. Right. Well, we need to do the same in our business. When money comes in, mm -hmm. the very first thing you need to do as a business owner is to move a portion, a percentage of that $1,000 deposit into different accounts, different small plates. I suggest that there's there's four core accounts to set up a profit account, okay. owner's pay account, tax account, and operating expenses, what we use to run our business. Right, right. Depending on the size of your business, and actually that free download we're going to share later yeah. on has this chart. I, I have different percentages, but basically uh, if you have if you have a business that does under a million dollars, roughly fifteen percent of that money should be allocated to profit. So a thousand dollars comes in, a hundred and fifty goes into profit. Fifteen? Oh, 15 percent? Fifteen. Okay. 15. Owners pay for most sub million dollar businesses is upwards of 30 or 40 percent. So that means, say, 30 percent. A thousand dollars comes in, three hundred dollars is allocated right. to owners pay. Mm -hmm. Another 15 percent or so should be allocated to taxes <clears throat> because ultimately a business should be paying your taxes. You shouldn't be surprised in the year saying, oh, I owe taxes. No, your business should pay for this. We have to allocate money there. And what that means then is about 40 percent goes into operating expenses. Mm -hmm. So when a thousand dollar check comes in, yeah. It does not mean that we have $1,000 for expenses. You have 40% of that. $400 goes into our operating expenses to pay bills. And by pre-allocating money, what happens now is we see the small plates. We see what money is available for what purpose. Okay. And then you notice that I don't have $1,000 to pay bills. I only have $400. I, I need to cut my expenses. Mm -hmm. I need to be more frugal. And, and this also, by, by allocating this money first, this is the principle of, Vegetables first. You're first putting money where it belongs. You're, you're taking care of the business and yourself first. Second step is the meat and potatoes. Second step is to pay the bills with what's left over in that operating expense account. Okay, that's great. So, a little scary, but it was great to have you divide it up into kind of four basic accounts, right? For, for a business. Just exactly. want to recap that. So, that was really great. And how the owner takes their own percentage, like say it's 30 or 40 percent, right? And they put it into a, an account rather than living off of that big serving plate with the turkey on it. Right. 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 But that's how most people do. What most people do, we look at that account. And, and so what it results in is these highs and lows. Like say a big check comes in. Yeah. Say for me, like if a, if a $10,000 check comes in, that's a big check. Right. $10,000 check comes into my business. Mm -hmm. I look at my bank account. I'm like, whoa, I'm getting paid this week, baby. Big money. And then I look at my stack of bills I've piled up and say, well, I better pay these bills. And then, oh, my God, I have more due than I expected. I can't take any money this week. And so it's these constant highs and lows, highs and right. lows. 
very puts us in a very reactionary kind of panic mode, a survival mode. Right, and that's I, yeah. That's great. No, that's a great idea to really have your accounts set up so that you're always dividing it up so that you're you're living in reality. You're not just, you know, just living off of the the big turkey. I always think that's of that. Exactly. Now. It forces yeah, exactly. And it's a great visual. I mean, it forces you to live in reality mm -hmm. and when, once you realize you don't have nearly as much money available for expenses, it's a little bit of a, a cold bucket of water in your face. Yeah. It's like, whoa. But mm -hmm. it empowers you because now you know what you need to make your business run on. You've got to make your business very lean and mean, and this forces that. Absolutely, and, and I think it's the next step. It's perfect from reading the pumpkin plan and how you have to just kind of take the, the little pumpkins that are just taking the the – all the food and the nutrients from the yeah. main vine. Oh, I, I listened. I well, I read. I love. I guess. And then now you're you're progressing to show those same businesses who read that book and also toilet paper. That's another story. But uh, <laughs> entrepreneur, it's like a cult yeah. classic. It's ridiculous. So uh, yeah, so this is like the next progression and how you can stay profitable, right? Learn how to, you know, keep those clients that are making you money and build and nurture those, and then stay in a profitable place yeah i wrote those books in that sequence because well first i wrote toilet paper entrepreneur because i i felt compelled to write it uh -huh. but then i started asking my readers i said well what's the problem you're facing now yeah well toilet paper entrepreneur was all about getting started and, and following who you are and exploiting yourself your passion and so forth and doing it very frugally right then people said mike i got my business started it's not growing fast right. enough help me make it grow so i wrote pumpkin plan now, here's an interesting trap with Pumpkin Plan. You start growing your business, and, and maybe you, you hit the numbers that you always dreamed about, mm -hmm. but the, the business becomes kind of a cash-eating monster. So that's why I wrote yeah. Profit First. And, and now that you've started to grow, how do you get control of the financials? Right. Otherwise, you become enslaved to your business. Yes. And No, I think it's great. And you're listening to what entrepreneurs want and need, and I think it's great how you came out with this book. Then you know that there's a need when you come out with it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, fine. I'm to some degree. I, I hope I'm taking my own medicine. Yes. F identify who your best consumers are. For me, it's readers. Mm -hmm. Communicate with them. Talk with them. Learn from them, and then write or, or produce a product, mm -hmm. a book that serves what they need next. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a great business model. Um, so I want to ask you, what taps are you? Talk about that a little bit in the book. <laughs> so are they yeah. the starting point? or the place you end up the end game? Great question. You See, I love someone who's so prepared. I love it. Well, so uh, TAPS mm -hmm. stands for Target Allocation Percentages. Okay. It's the percentages we just talked about. Mm -hmm. You have that big serving tray, that yeah. big turkey, uh, a $10,000 check. That's your income. Got it. You now need to divide it up to these different accounts, profit, owner's pay. I said profits should be 15%, for example. Well, that's a TAP, mm -hmm. a Target Allocation Percentage. Okay. That's where we should be targeting and try to get to. Here's the key. When people learn the system, and basically you've learned the basics already, so folks watching right now could actually start doing this, call their bank, set up some accounts. Mm -hmm. One mistake I see people make is they say, wow, I'm going to start allocating 15% right away. I, I, no, you know what? I may do 30% because I want to be really profitable. And there's this excitement to do this, but it's like, it's like saying I'm going to start working out, and that first day you just work out so hard. You just, and the next morning your muscles are cramped. You've teared to our muscles. You can't move from the couch, and the program becomes a failure because it's way too intense too fast. Mm -hmm. So taps are what we're targeting. And as I said, I have this in the, what we'll share after, at the end of this uh, interview. Okay. I'll share the, uh, in the book all the different targets I suggest. But to get started with the program with Profit First, don't start at 15%. That's where we're moving toward. Instead, start whatever profit you've had in the past. Say it's been 1% of your income and add 1% more. Okay. So if you made, if, if of your total income, 2% was profit last year, add 1% and start and starting now, our allocation percentage is going to be 3%. I call this caps, by the way, current allocation okay. percentage. So your cap is what you're doing now, your current allocation percentage. Mm -hmm. Tap is what you're targeting. Then next quarter, so every 90 days, there's four quarters a year, every 90 days, add another percent. So do 3% profit, every deposit, 3% goes to profit. Next quarter, 4%. Next quarter, 5%. And within a couple of years, you'll be up in the 10, you know, the digits, the 10 or 15%. So very quickly, you can ramp up. But what this allows is for your business to adjust. 
Because if you add 1% more to profit, if you add 1% more to pay, maybe you allocate a little more to taxes because you're going to have more taxes, right. which you know, usually more taxes, while that sucks, it's an indication that you're actually making money. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. To get those percentages there, you must reduce your expenses. So if you were doing 40% going to operating expenses before, now it's got to be 39, 38. You got to push that down. This adjustment of just adjusting a little 1% every quarter, getting closer and closer to that tap, allows your business to adjust in a much more healthy way. It's not too abrupt. Okay. Okay, so is there an individual tap for each type of a business, or is it just a principle? Yeah, so every business ultimately has its tap, and, okay. and every business can argue it's unique. In the book, I break it out based upon revenue ranges. If you do under a million, here's what you should be doing. If you're between one and three million, here's what you should be, three to ten. Now, this is from what I studied. Okay. The thing is, your business may be able to do greater on taps. Maybe it can't. But the thing is, that's great about this is those are simply targets, what we're shooting for, our goal. But we start low, and you start moving it up. At a certain point, it's going to be hard to move it up. You can't cut expenses anymore. Maybe that's your optimal resting point. I challenge you to say once you hit a wall, see if there's a way to push through it. It's like working out. At a certain point, you have a certain degree of fitness, and you feel you've hit a wall. Sometimes it's changing the exercises, and you can break right. through it. Same thing with these allocation percentages. That's great. That's great. So let me ask you this. What should business owners be doing every quarter, say? I know you break it up in, in very nice little bite-sized chunks that are very easily yeah. digestible. So I know you talk about this in the book. Um, what should a business owner be doing like every quarter? Yeah. So you probably heard it on the news when you turn on the radio. At the end of the mm -hmm. quarter, uh, the public companies announce their distributions. Yes. Like Ford says, hey, we have 15 cents a share. Uh, and then it's like, huh, I kind of wish I owned right. Ford, you know, or whatever it is. You hear distributions. Small business, mm -hmm. us as owners of business, quarterly must also be doing a profit distribution. Okay. So, so this money is piling up, right? You, every time a deposit comes in, you're putting a percentage right. away, a percentage away. At the end of the quarter, you may have, you know, a small business may have a couple thousand bucks saved up in profit. Uh, uh, some, some bigger small businesses... 20000 30000 bucks is not too abnormal. Mm -hmm. What you do at the end of the quarter is you take a portion of that money out. I suggest half the money. Half stays in as a rainy day fund because there may be one day that someone gets ill, the business gets hurt, you need some kind right, of cushioning. Right. You can become your own bank. But say, say there's, just for round number six, say there's, there's $10,000 of profit that's accumulated in there. Take half of that $5,000 out as a profit distribution. And, and this goes right to you. Now, the, the rule with this is that money is profit. You're not allowed to put it back into the business. That would defeat the system. You can't plow it back. You can't reinvest. You go on vacation with that. You celebrate with that. You get the thing you've always wanted with that. This is where your business is no longer a cash-eating monster. You're changing the dial that now it's serving you. It's a cash cow. And you need to do this because it's a celebration. You know, if you get 5000 bucks extra, out of your business, in addition to paying you whatever is going on, you know, as owners pay, an extra five thousand bucks in profit every quarter—it's awesome. Sounds great. And when, 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 and when Ford says we have a fifteen percent per, you know, per share distribution, you're like fifteen cents. Mm -hmm. I got five thousand bucks coming out, pal. Like it really empowers mm -hmm. you. It really empowers you. And quarterly is the, is the way to do it. That's what big companies do. Small companies can and should do okay. it. Okay, yeah. that's great. So I want to ask you about the system profit first. Is there a risk of businesses doing it alone? How should they approach it? Yeah, so there is a risk of doing it alone. Many entrepreneurs say, this is great. You have the whole system now. You can start doing it. I hope you start doing it immediately. But there's a problem is there's going to become a day where you can't pay your bills or you had a quiet sales month or three consecutive months and it's really tough. That's when, if we're by ourselves, it's easy to say, well, I'm going to stop doing this profit thing. I'm going to put that on hold. I'm going to borrow from myself. And we start defeating the mm -hmm. system. You see, when, when you don't have enough money to pay bills, that's your business screaming at you and shaking you saying, you can't incur these bills any longer. You've got to stop doing this. But it's easy to borrow from ourselves. So when we're doing this by ourselves, it's easy to break the own, our own rules. We need accountability partners. And this is like, a, you know, like working out at the gym. If you want to get the best workouts, a get partner. Uh, a partner. Someone else that's going through the experience right. with you. I mean, you really want to crank it up? Get a partner and a trainer. So a trainer knows the process, has been through with hundreds of other people, can tell you how to do without getting hurt, can get you past the plateaus. A workout partner is someone that's in the game with you and is going to work. You know, when you don't want to work out, they're calling you saying, 
hey, Vicky, you're showing up. I'm at the gym waiting for you. And it's like, oh, yes, I'm showing up. In our business, get an accountability partner. I suggest two types. Get one, uh, another entrepreneur or a group of entrepreneurs that are, um, are, are in, in the profit game too, that want to maximize their profits and support each other. In fact, on my website, MikeMcCallowitz.com, I have a resources mm -hmm. section. I set up a guide there for how you can run meetings with peers. It's totally free. Just, just do it, and you can support mm -hmm. each other. The second thing is get a, get a trainer. Your, your accountant or bookkeeper should be helping you guide profitability. And I'll tell you, if you have an accountant or bookkeeper that does your taxes or does your books but doesn't help you maximize your profitability, they're not a trainer. Um, there's folks out there, I, I call them profit first professionals. These are people that are understand the necessity for businesses to be highly profitable and can help guide you. So uh, I, I have a resource for that too on my website if you check it out uh, on the resources section. I can hook you up with an accountant or bookkeeper that does that if, if your bookkeeper doesn't. Um, but you, you, you should have a professional that's helping you drive profitability. Right. I, and I'm interested to know. This, um, this wasn't a planned question, but I'm very curious because you speak like very passionately about accounting and the importance for businesses to really understand where their profit rests um, before they just keep going out and get more and more business and just not turn profit. Yeah. So do you have a background in accounting? I'm just curious. No, no, no accounting. Actually, I was a D student in college. So I, and I was a finance major. I struggled, of all things I struggled most with accounting. And I, I think here's the deal. I think accounting sucks. <laughs> I still do. I, I think it's too complicated. I think there's way too much going on. The system I'm telling you is, it, it supports accounting, but it's really a cash management system. It, ironically, just getting this small, simple stuff right that I'm sharing mm -hmm. about, all the accounting on the back end takes care of itself. You don't have to worry about the accounting. So these small steps takes care of everything. And that's why um, this has been so successful for me because I hate the accounting. I, an income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, time together, understand what's your inventory turn, all this stuff. It makes my mind want to explode. I had to find a better way. That's why I did okay, this. So, so you're more the strategy and then you hand it off to your accountant when you do these simple steps to just take your money and put it in these you know, smaller accounts and just have a way to go through it, right? Right. So, yeah, I, I do this every single day myself. I, the natural tendency of myself, and I think most entrepreneurs, is to log into our bank account every day. Every morning I log in see what my balance is. I do not go into my, uh, my accounting system and, and print out my income okay. statement and tie it to cash flow okay. every day. But, so this system you're learning is all about what we naturally do. Our natural habit is to log into our bank account. If you set these additional accounts, you do these percentages, it all takes care of itself. Then, once a quarter, I meet with my accountant. He's, he helps me enforce profitability. I've taught him this system, and he's helping me now. He runs the books. He does the reconciliations, right. all the accounting stuff. And uh, it's funny. I have a meeting with him next week. It's, it's my most profitable quarter ever. And last quarter, when I met with Keith, my accountant, he goes, Mike, I don't know how you've done this, but what a turnaround. Your, your business has been so profitable. He goes, five consecutive years of profitability. He's never seen this in any business. Now, think about that. Logically, Accounting all makes sense and it works. Just the way entrepreneurs behave, we don't sync up with it, not most okay. of us. So therefore, by doing this system, it forces profitability. And the result for me has been five consecutive years of profitability. Uh, for every, everyone that's actually used a system that, that has stuck with it, all of them have increased their profitability Be because it just forces you to. You, there's no alternative. If you follow the system, you have to sure, be profitable. Sure. And, and I'm, I'm interested to know, again, this is not a planned question, but I'm so intrigued um, by your responses. <laughs> you, um, right. you have a profitability of consecutively, right, of five years. Yeah. So yeah. has your business been profitable in the same way or have you increased your services or offerings? How has that happened? All right, so this is the weirdest okay. thing. I'm doing less stuff. I mean, I offer less okay. services, but I've gotten better and better at it and it's resulted in a premium. And here, here's a better explanation okay. of that. When people hear about Profit First, at first, they say, wow, it sounds like I'm really going to drive profitability, but I can't grow. I mean, my business, all I'm going to do is try to squeeze out every single dollar. I can't grow mm -hmm. like that. The irony is actually you'll grow faster, and my business has grown faster too. The reason is this. Profit First makes you have less uh, money available for expenses. Mm -hmm. Less money available for expenses means you need to be way more efficient. To get the same things done with less money, you need to be more efficient. 
it also forces you to drop kind of the losing things. So uh, if you offer in your business five or six different offerings, I can do web design, I can do logos, I can do brochures, I can do packaging, all these things. This large offering will say, you know, packaging, I rarely do the package design. Um, I'm not that efficient at it. It's really, it takes a lot of effort and costs me a lot of subcontractors. I'm going to dump okay. that. So profit first because there's less money. You start dumping things that aren't your core efficiency. Then you get more and more focused on the thing you do really well. Say it's, it's web design. Just picking okay. something. If you're, now I'm saying, well, I'm betting more and more on web design. I better become better and better at it. And you start becoming really capable in that category. When that happens, clients are more attracted to you and willing to pay a premium. It's the, it's the old general practitioner doctor mm -hmm. versus the heart surgeon. A general practitioner can, can diagnose a lot of situations. When they figure out what's going on, they then refer you to the specialist. So a general practitioner makes very little money. Th those doctors, I hate to say it, but are struggling. Because we go in, we, we, something's wrong with my chest, I'm coughing. Doctor checks out and says, ooh, that's indications of a heart attack. Go to the heart attack specialist who's going to charge you a thousand times more, but knows what they're doing in all right, aspects right. of the heart. And of course, me, I'm going to, I want the specialist. When I have a real need, I want the right. specialist. So customers with the real need for web design or whatever will go to the specialist. The folks who don't care so much or doing the initial checkup will go to the generalist. So it's interesting. Profit First makes us more focused to do fewer things but to do it at a better level, and that attracts the best customers who pay a premium. Right. So, so for my own business, just to wrap up, I am getting kind of fired up, <laughs> here, by the way. I'm like, <laughs> I, I love this okay, stuff. Okay. So for, for me, yeah. my, my, my thing is I'm, my books and speaking. Like That's the two things I enjoy the most, I'm the best mm -hmm. at, and are uh, most lucrative to my readership. Well, sure enough, as I've committed myself more and more to public speaking, I get – you know, I get paid like $20,000 for a speaking gig today where rewind four or five years ago when I was starting out and trying to do consulting, all these uh -huh. different things. I was doing zero for a speaking gig. You know, I wasn't getting paid a dime. I was, I was getting maybe 500 bucks for a travel reimbursement. Right. So by becoming more and more focused, I've, I've gotten a little bit better, a little bit better. I'm trying to get to the heart surgeon level as a speaker, but and sure enough, customers are coming with, with bigger and bigger offers because they recognize that and they want a specialist. Right. And this is true for my books, and, and that's basically the two things I do. The one key, too, is I have other vendors going on. I hire or partner with a specialist in that category. So I have a consulting group around Profit First. I don't run that. I, I do a lot of public speaking about it. I don't run it. I have hired a guy, and actually he's an equity piece of business. That's his exclusive job. He's a specialist in that category. So for me to expand my businesses into other areas – I bring on someone on board that that's their specialty. That's the exclusive thing they're going to do. And I just feed it from the stuff that I'm okay, doing. So you're outsourcing the help to, and letting the specialist run the show. Yeah, always hire specialists. Gotcha. So pro and Profit First forces that to happen. You have to do it. There's no alternative. Right. Right. Is there a special size of a business that uh, is going to benefit from Profit First? Or is it for really any size business? It's for any size. And, and the proof is that... Um, I've been engaged now by a public company. They brought in our profit first team. There's a desk over there where he says. Wait, point it. again. I didn't but, see it. Oh, yeah, yeah, over that okay. way. You can't see. Gotcha. I, I'd have to pick up my camera and move <laughs> it. But if you go around the corner here, I mean, I can swing you around a little bit. I don't <gasps> know if you can see. I'm trying to. Nah, you can't make it. It's it's down the hallway. Uh, but you have um, a board just like mine on the wall behind you, but you can't see it. You crane around and see it. Yeah, there. Oh, that that yeah, board. The same one right yeah, behind that's you. My, yeah. So yeah. funny. Um, so, um, what was the question? I can't remember that, now. It, what, what size do businesses need oh, to be? Oh, size. Yeah. So, you know, I found this works for companies of any size. So, I had a public company that engaged our gotcha. services, and uh, they've implemented profit first in their budgeting effectively up front, and they've become more profitable. Uh, countless startups have approached me and said, well, I don't even have any business coming in yet. Should I wait? No, start immediately because you want your profit habit to be in place from day one. If you can be profitable off of, say, the, over the entire year, you do $10,000 of business over the entire year, and you can be profitable on that, you've set such a good habit up to be profitable at 100000 or a million or $100 million. So no matter what size you are, you have to implement this today. You can and you have to. Okay, and, and a question that, that you 
raise in my mind is what if a company has a lot of debt that they need to work off? Like they want to be profitable, right? Do they need to work off that debt first? What has to happen? Yes. So yes and no. You have to work that debt off immediately. No, you don't do that first, which is kind of a weird answer. But here's how you do it. If you have debt, we have to eradicate it. But you have to establish this profit habit. Too many people say, well, I'm, I'm going to pay off my debt first, and then I'll worry about profit first later. And then profit first never happens. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when people say that, I'm like, haven't you already been doing that? Haven't you had this debt for a while? Haven't you been saying you're going to pay this off first anyway? Mm -hmm. And you haven't, so it's not working. Here's what you do. Set the same system, put your 10 or 15% toward profit, let it accumulate, forces the efficiency because uh, there's less money for expenses. Then on a quarterly basis when you do your profit distribution, that money that comes out, the vast majority, 95% of that $5,000 check that comes out, so 4900 bucks, goes to hitting the debt. Okay. A few dollars, a hundred dollars is left to still celebrate because we still need to be in that celebratory mode. You're not going on vacation now, but you took a big chunk of debt away and you go out for a real nice dinner on a hundred bucks. So you have to keep the profit habit going no matter what. You have to implement this immediately and then the debt will be wiped out every quarter. You're going to be hitting it really hard. This is fantastic. This is been so inspirational to myself because this is something that I want to learn for myself and my oh. business. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I want to let you all know that there is a hashtag profit first. Okay. And you'll see one of the pictures that kind of got us connected uh, starting out, right, Mike? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, it's hashtag profit first. And you'll see tons of uh, people that have been already jumping in on the conversation. It's just a real motivational an inspiring book and, and I highly recommend that you that you pick it up and where can people get that book yeah so you can get the uh, the hardcover if you want or the um, the Kindle version or the audio version all on Amazon and Amazon has the best price going on right now so that's where I suggest okay. you pick it that's up. that's great and uh, this this is going to be available on YouTube okay so if you're watching this right now that's probably where you are or on my blog where the video is embedded but it will also be podcast number 40 so if you want, we're actually at 40 now. When, when uh, we connected, wow. I was at the beginning uh, when I started out my wow. podcast. Yeah, so we're, we're at episode 40 now. So all of the resources um, and everything discussed in this um, interview, including a download for all of our viewers and listeners, right? And what is that um, download? Based? It's like the best download ever. It's like half the book. Nice. It's five chapters of Profit First. So if you, uh, if you read that, you'll have enough stuff to implement the entire system. It's what we discussed now. The second half of the book, that's the one you'd have to buy, is the advanced concepts, how to take this to another okay, level. The how. But, uh, the how, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a great download. It's, you can't get it anywhere else. You can't even go to my website and get five chapters. It's only with Vicky. Yeah, just so. here. Just here, yeah. right here, folks. Thank you. Yeah. So how can people get in touch with you, Mike? Yeah, if you want to check me out, go to MikeMichalowitz.com. I know that's hard to spell, Vicky. I know you'll put up a link, but uh, give your best stab at spelling it. The <laughs> one blessing is I'm the best. I'm the only Mike Michalowicz in the world, so I got the best SEO. Give your best stab at it. It'll find me. My website has this book, uh, my other books too, free chapters from there, uh, a blog, um, tons of free resources, uh, and a newsletter that's pretty killer. So you can sign up. For that I too. love it. I love it very much, and and I love the, uh, the visuals because I'm into visual marketing. So I'm, yeah. I always look at websites and see how, you know, the flow goes and see where my eye, you know, kind of tracks. Yeah, And yeah, so yeah. you have these great visuals. So if you mouse over, you do something. Really cool. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. And that's actually, I might write my next book about that. Um, I'm a big fan of marketing, but particularly uh, behavioral marketing, how the psychology of the mind works. Yes. And so I employed that in my website. And uh, yeah, maybe sharing details about the, the tricks of the, of the trade sort of absolutely that's great so uh i'm actually working on my first book i know that you have nice. three now so i'm working to go towards bestseller status i'm aiming high okay good well so, I, I suspect i have a feeling you'll you do think? it <laughs> i hope so so uh, yeah i think so thank you so if you want to check out this podcast um go to um saywowmarketing.com slash itunes or saywowmarketing.com slash stitcher if you use stitcher on an android um, it's also saywowmarketing.com is my website. I'm on Twitter. You are too, Mike. And we're on Google+, Facebook. We're all over the place. So, the yeah, place. so look forward to connecting with you. If you have any questions or comments, please, you know, reach out to us and we'll be happy to answer them. Mike, thank you so much for this interview today. Thank you. Peace. Thanks so much. Peace out. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.